So in the previous sections, we were looking through parts of chapter two and chapter four, just as a refresher on how DNA and genes are structured and the general process of transcription as it relates to gene expression. So in chapters a little bit later in the semester, we'll be looking at mutations and the consequences of DNA sequence and changes in DNA sequence on the proteins. But for now, we're gonna get a little bit of a taste of what it means to be a geneticist, both in a historical context and what that might mean in the current context of genetics. So we're gonna do that by looking at how we can observe phenotypes, connect them to genotypes in a way, and use that to solve some problems like diagramming out biochemical pathways. So we can actually start thinking about this um, by just putting ourselves in the mindset of the way a scientist might think. So again, Previously, in the first few videos, we talked about scientists that contributed to understanding that DNA is an important molecule, understanding the structure of this molecule, how it replicates, and how it is the basis of heredity. So scientists were really beginning to embrace the idea that DNA is going to be this heritable unit. And there was kind of a general understanding that genes would be a portion of the DNA. Of course, we in 2021 have a really good idea of what a gene looks like in terms of the DNA, but we didn't really know what that necessarily meant, what the sequence of these genes would be at the time. We just knew that they were sort of units that could be linked to our physical attributes or our phenotypes. So there are things that we did know, we understood again, heredity, it's going to happen. But there are a lot of things we didn't know. Okay. So most of the time we're thinking about early genetics, we didn't have any type of way to get the DNA sequence. It was, you know, a little bit difficult to figure out what a gene actually was, how big was that piece of DNA, what was in it, how, you know, it's going to actually be set up. And most of the time, because of this, we didn't have a lot of access to that information at the time. We study genetics by actually doing this indirectly looking at the physical traits that they would cause. Of course, throughout the semester, we're gonna really have a lot of examples of this, um, particularly as we get to the last third of the class. But again, setting up the way that a scientist historically might think about genetics when they don't have access to DNA sequence and don't know a lot about the actual structure of the genes that they're looking at, okay? Like they don't know, even know what those genes code for. So things that they didn't know, again, they, they might know that somewhere there was a piece of DNA that controlled a trait. And we'll talk about, again, some examples of traits. They did not know what that piece of DNA was. They didn't know if it coded for an enzyme they didn't know if it coded for a transcription factor, a receptor. They didn't know at all what that would be. They just knew somewhere something genetic was controlling this trait. And again, no access to sequencing. Difficult to know where this piece of DNA was located, not only on the chromosome that it's on, but throughout the entire genome of whatever organism that they're looking for. So if this was a human gene, they might know, okay, we understand that this particular disease, um, for example, the alcaptonuria that you guys saw when we talked about Archibald Gerard in one of the previous videos, um, looking at, again, alcaptonuria was uh, individuals that had black urine. And so this was, you know, could be traced kind of linked in families. They knew somewhere in the genetic makeup something was causing that that could be inherited. They didn't know what chromosome, it could have been on any of the chromosomes, they had no idea. So kind of putting yourself in that mindset, I think will be a good way to approach the experiments we're gonna talk about in a moment. And the things that they did know, again, they knew that something heritable controlled the physical trait. And just to get used to some vocabulary, um, at least in current genetics, um, you know, historically as well, to some extent, they might call this piece of genetic material a locus. 
So when you hear the term locus to refer to something like a heritable trait, the kind of underlying meaning behind that is, again, you know that it's somewhere in the DNA, but you don't know a lot of details. You don't know what gene it is. You don't know where it is sometimes. Okay, so a locus, kind of a general term for, you know, one, what we're specifically going to figure out will be a gene later. So getting used to that vocabulary, I'll probably use it quite a bit. Okay, and depending on the organism that they're looking at, they could use selective breeding, kind of in the vein of a Gregor Mendel style experiment to figure out certain aspects of this trait. Was it controlled by one gene? Were there many genes involved? Even how different genes that were related in a pathway, um, an example that we'll be using in a moment here will be um, actually biosynthesis of amino acids, so those pathways. We can even sometimes tell how different genes or loci are going to be connected in a pathway. So again, this sounds a little bit vague, but I think if you kind of, again, put yourself in the mindset of really the only resource we have right now to understand a heritable unit in history is to think about the phenotype and the ratios of that phenotype and you know how that's going to compare to the other um, individuals in that population. So again, I think this sounds really vague without an example. So just keep these in mind as we go through the next set of experiments. So one of the main experiments that I think most geneticists like to talk about when I think about kind of particularly putting genes in order of pathways and thinking about how genes actually, again, will be sort of a unit that gets transcribed, generally translated into a protein. One of the main experiments we like to talk about is the beetle and tatum experiment. So some of you guys may have heard of this before. Um, and so the work that beetle and tatum did led to what is referred to as the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. And so what they're really looking for here is the idea that one gene, you know, in, in the most current sense of the word, will be transcribed, translated into a protein. In, and they're kind of using enzyme because at the time, enzymes were like the proteins that everybody studied. So we know, again, in 2021, that a gene, first of all, one gene can sometimes lead to many different products depending on RNA processing and splicing, but also it doesn't have to be a protein or an enzyme that comes from it. It's just some type of product. Um, later in the semester, we'll even talk about some non-coding RNAs that actually function in the cell in their RNA form. But regardless, we're thinking again about a gene as being sort of a unit that will give us a functional product in the cell. And so they use an organism called Neurospora, which is a bread mold. And they're looking for um, differences in the ability of these different molds to actually survive um, in the present absence of particular nutrients. So these are gonna be called actually oxytrophic mutants. Um, so I'll be saying that uh, as we kind of go through the slides. So I think something important to think about is why bread mold, okay? So why bread mold indeed, right? There's a lot of reasons to use bread mold, okay? So Neurospora, again, very interesting um, in a lot of ways, but the reason that we really wanna use this is gonna be largely because it's easy to grow. It's gonna produce many offspring quickly, okay? You guys, you guys know we live in Louisiana and like in your dorm room and in your house, you leave something out, it's moist here, right? So mold can just grow on it. You know how fast that comes. So really when we, I've highlighted this in red because as we move through the semester, one thing that you'll really see is valuable is that attribute of producing many offspring quickly. So 
usually assay studies in genetics require thousands of offspring at the end of the day, depending on what it is you're trying to do. So something that reproduces very slowly, like trees, to get thousands of those, you know, that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. But if you have something that reproduces as quickly as mole does and gives you thousands of offspring, beautiful. Additionally, just to add this in, no paperwork to do if you mess with it. There's no ethics or moral quandaries about messing with mold. And you're going to see we're going to do some pretty messed up stuff to them. Fruit flies, another, um, definitely another victim of genetic assays. But again, easy to work with. You don't have to worry about should you be doing this. It's, it's bread mold. It's not a big deal. Okay, so this is you know one of the reasons I'm a plant biologist because I like that aspect of working with a model organism. So also one of the big things about this particular um, organism is that it alternates between a haploid and diploid state. Okay, so why is that important? Okay, so we can think about that just for a second. Think about some things we haven't reviewed yet, but we've talked about in other classes. Recessive traits, dominant traits, okay? So you guys know that if you have sort of a heterozygote situation where you've got a dominant allele and a recessive allele, the recessive will be masked. And a lot of time, the mutations that we're gonna be looking at, the phenotypes that we might see from those mutations are masked by the presence of a dominant gene. So having something haploid, this makes it easier to see those mutations and put those on display without the worry of it being masked by a dominant gene or complicated by incomplete dominance. So having haploid is really a, like a beautiful thing. Um, so they sort of alternate. And again, they're haploid and you know, they have this phase where they can produce asexual offspring. And then they also have a mechanism for sexual reproduction, which allows them to be uh, crossed, which again, some of these things that may not be immediately apparent to you, why that would be important. But again, as we move through the semester, those are gonna be some traits that we're gonna be talking about when we work with model organisms and hopefully you know, become a little bit more internal why that's um, really nice. Okay, so we've talked about some of the pros. Now let's just take a minute, and this is not gonna be the main point of this exercise, but I think it's important to understand the organism you're working with on the front end. Think about the actual life cycle of this. Okay, so what we've got here, again, are gonna be two mating types. So they're haploid. These are like spores or ascospores. Um, so these are going to be all haploid and we have opposite mating types. Okay, so like, a and sometimes like something like alpha, but like little a here. So basically these have to be two different mating types. That doesn't really matter. The point is that these things are gonna be haploid. So they can grow into their little haploid bodies, okay? Um, and they can produce asexual spores, nydia, okay? And they can germinate. They can continue sort of building this um, vegetative mycelium via asexual sort of reproduction. So everything kind of budding from that original haploid ascospore. Okay, similar parallel on the other side, our opposite mating type is doing the same thing, but these guys are still haploid. Okay, so all of their little cells are haploid. So what that means is that they have the opportunity to perform sexual reproduction together. So let's see how that works. Okay, so what actually happens with these guys? Um, beautiful union here of A and alpha type. Okay, so we can actually fuse cells together. So notice this, this is gonna be our purple mating type. This one's our orange. Okay, when these grow close to each other, okay, they're like getting ready to go here. Cells that connect can actually fuse. Notice the nuclei are distinct at this point, but in the next phase, they're actually gonna merge. 
So this is like one big cell with two nuclei. They're haploid nuclei, so when they merge, they are now diploid. Okay, so this is their their version of sexual reproduction. Okay, and so then their next phase, of course, during the sexual reproduction meiosis, there's a lot of beautiful things that can go on here, which we won't talk about until one of the later chapters. Um, but for now, meiosis, okay, their first division, and then meiosis second division, okay. As meiosis proceeds, these guys are going to be haploid again, okay. So we've had a round of sexual reproduction, we're haploid again, and now we've produced these um, ascospores again within the ascus, okay, and they're going to be ready to go. Okay, so the ideal thing to remember is that this ascospore, which is mostly what we're going to be um, looking at, or this ascus and these ascospores within it, are actually going to be, each one of these is a separate product of meiosis, okay? These four here are going to be a separate product of meiosis. We have a final round of mitosis, so some of these, you know, kind of like in pairs or identical, but think about these as having like four separate meiotic products. So each one of these, because of the sexual reproduction, has a chance to be like slightly different, okay, from each other. So that's a lot of offspring that we can use. And then additionally, we can, you know, grow them up to be haploid and see any phenotypes that come out of it. Okay, so that's a beautiful thing. Okay, so again, some of these traits are gonna be really um, important. They're going to be a theme, any type of model organism we work with, these are going to be considerations. So um, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind and we'll proceed with this experiment. So the first thing that we need to do is, of course, this, we can like just tell what's in our little test tube, okay? This is the media, all right? So it's like growing at a slant. These are the bread molds growing and our offspring growing. This is, I think, just some cotton to keep it in. Um, keeping sterile, all right? Here's the deal. Most of this stuff is wild type, okay? So sometimes in nature you can find, you know, natural differences in things, but you know, when you have something simple like bread mold, it might be a little difficult to see, um, kind of observe natural differences. Genetics is all about genotype and phenotype. And if you don't have any physical differences, there's nothing to observe. So the first thing that we're gonna do is create mutants via X-ray mutagenesis. So we really just shoot them with X-rays, okay? And this, these X-rays, we'll talk about several different types of mutagens that you can use. The thing to remember about X-rays is that what we're trying to do is get a dosage of X-rays where in principle, we only hit maybe one, just statistically, one piece of DNA per um, cell here. So we're hoping we're not trying to tear it apart. We're just trying to hopefully break one thing. Um, and this is again just based off of the dosage and um, sort of the X-ray sto stoichiometry, if you want to call it that. Okay, so we're trying to break one thing and remembering that we do not have any control over this, okay? So it could be anywhere. It could be in something important. It could be in something that kills this. It could be somewhere that doesn't have any effect whatsoever. There's just a lot of things that can happen. And this is one of the reasons why having a lot of offspring is important because then statistically you'll get some interesting things. So why x-rays? Again, the point of mutagenizing something just in general, most of the time in genetics is not to like you know, try to like sort of Frankenstein monster or something up. It's to create an observable phenotype when otherwise everything would look the same. So we're trying to create a difference that we can observe and then we can go in and figure out what genes are involved. Okay, and so again, in principle, all these neurospores were the same. Um, so no differences to compare. We're gonna find something observable. And I gave you a spoiler, we're gonna be looking at oxytrophic mutants. So these um, guys that don't, they can't make their own nutrients the way wild type can, okay? So once we create these guys, we can cross them with a wild type of the opposite mating type. 
Okay. So don't get too hung up on that. Most of the time, the reason for that, these are haploid. They have a mutation. Most of the time, it's just like to kind of keep them alive and allow them to keep reproducing. Um, this strategy can vary depending on what you're working with. Here's our little fruiting bodies. And what we're going to end up with is um, an ascus full of these spores. And remember that each one of these spores kind of represents, in general, it's going to be like its own product of meiosis. So it's like its own child, okay? Each one's a different child. So we have to separate them from each other because they're not necessarily identical, okay? So we're looking for that. And these are haploid again. So in principle, we can, um, again, see any recessive phenotypes. Okay, so once we get these ascospores, um, dissected out of this ascus, we're ready to go. All right, so that's our next step. In our third step, what we're gonna do is actually take these individual spores, okay? And we're going to put each one in its own tube. So remember, each one has its own potential to show a different mutation. So this guy, let's say we put it in that tube. This guy, let's say, put it in that tube, et cetera, okay? So each one of these, I didn't finish with the circles because I thought it would look a little bit cluttered, but you can think, okay, each one, and I just picked a tube at random, but each one is in its own tube and it's allowed to, again, reproduce haploid, asexual growth. So everything in the tube is identical. All the cells within the tube are identical to the starting cell. So you can imagine it's really important not to contaminate this you have to be very careful, very sterile, get only the one that you're looking for in this tube or you could really mess up, okay? So any differences that we're gonna see will be found between tubes. So if we do find a mutation, they're gonna be found like between tubes, not within this, you know, these tubes themselves, but looking, comparing tubes to each other. Another thing to point out about this experiment is right now, we are growing these on complete medium. So this is our media. This is just what the um, cells are gonna grow on, okay? So the deal is complete medium has everything that these need to survive. So it's like just a complete diet, any vitamins, uh, minerals, any amino acids that maybe we could, we could synthesize these, but we're just gonna provide them. Okay, so the idea now is what we're doing now is not really the informational part of the experiment. What we're doing now is getting ready to do the informative part by growing these up. This creates stocks of different strains of Neurospora that we can use in subsequent experiments. The complete media just keeps everything alive. Okay, so this is again, this is not the experiment per se but we're getting ready to see the informative part. So in the informative part, what we wanna do is take cultures from the guys that we, their stocks in the complete media, which are given everything they need to live. And we're gonna make a little new tube, same thing on minimal media. Of course, keeping track, like if this is tube A, this is like our minimal media tube A. So we know exactly what's in each tube. Why minimal media? If you remember, we're gonna be looking for oxytrophic mutants. So we're looking for mutants who basically can't make their own sort of items that they need to survive. Um, most of these neurospora can make like a lot of the amino acids, et cetera, that they need to live. Um, so what we're looking for by contrast is something that can't do that, okay? So this will provide the condition where we can observe differences in the phenotype. So, so yes, we created the different genotype. Here we need to be able to observe it. So growing these on minimal media provides a condition where we can observe this difference. Okay, and so we're looking for phenotypic differences. And so if you're gonna take a look at these minimal media, which tube would you study, okay? And so really what we're gonna be looking at here in these two where nothing grows. 
I know like some things screwed here, here to this, but I think this, they weren't finished doing this, um, like actually plating them on. But then um, these guys are actually, once you do grow them, they are gonna grow. But this is the guy that you're looking for um, based on the fact that if we gave it everything it needed, it would stay alive. But when we grow it on minimal media, which doesn't have all the amino acids, it doesn't have all the you know mineral vitamins things that we could otherwise synthesize, it can't make something. That's kind of the upshot of this. These other normal wild type sort of thing, they can make everything they need to live. This one can't, okay? And that may not seem important. It may not seem important to your daily life, whether bread mold can make its own things or not. But remember what we're doing is we're just understanding the principle of how to go from, I see a phenotype, what is the genetics underlying this? Okay, how do we actually get from, here's a phenotype I see, to what gene is controlling it? Okay, and so this is gonna be part of the process that we see today. All right, so of course, no growth on minimal media, that's where we see our nutritional mutants. Okay, so basically what we're gonna to wanna to do is continue our studies with this strain. And there's nothing growing here, so we'll just, whenever we continue experiments, we'll just come back and get a little dip of what was in this complete media. Okay, so really the only thing that we know right now is that, again, this can't make something that it should be making and needs to survive, okay? So all we know right now is that there's a difference. It can't survive on minimal media. The other strains can. We do not know exactly what that is, but we're gonna find out by looking a little deeper into this, okay? So what we're gonna do is, this is that same picture we just saw, okay? Just kind of transferred onto this next slide. Add things slowly back. And by things, I mean, amino acids. So this is all of the 20 amino acids, minerals and vitamins. And then we've got a minimal control. So we wanna make sure that we still can't grow. It wasn't just a mess up. And then complete to make sure, you know, that this actually wasn't something dead. So just some controls here. But really what we wanna see is if we add something back, can we fix this, okay? So, once we start to add things back, you can see that we have some things going on here. So the minimal, we don't grow. Our complete, we do grow. Remember that the complete, we've given it everything that it needed. The minimal, we haven't given it what it, it needed. So you can compare the controls to the results. The minimal looks like the minimal plus vitamins. So even though we gave it vitamins, it didn't grow, which likely means that the vitamin was not necessarily what it needed. In this case, with the amino acids, we added the amino acids back, all of a sudden, it's ready to grow, okay? So what this tells us is that whatever's going on in the DNA of this particular strain, this can't synthesize an amino acid that it needs. Do we know which one it is? Absolutely not at this point. How do we figure out which one it is? That's right, we have to add in back all 20 one at a time. Okay, so we have to make now 20 tubes of minimal media, adding back in one amino acid per tube. Okay, so just taking a look at this, this is kind of one of these things doesn't belong here sort of a situation. You automatically, your eyes are drawn this to where this grows again, tryptophan. Okay, so again, the underlying sort of conclusion that you can get from adding each one of these back is that, yeah, okay, we added glycine back, that didn't fix it. We added alanine, that didn't fix it. We added all these guys, that didn't fix it. But when we add tryptophan, that fixed it. Okay, so what that means, we've kind of gone through the process now. We figured out first, this thing can't grow if not given everything it needs. Then we figured out, oh, what it's missing is an amino acid. Then in this last step, we figured out the amino acid it's missing is tryptophan. Okay, so what we know now is that this strain 
whatever we broke with those x-rays, it now has trouble making tryptophan on its own, whereas a wild type strain would not. Okay, so it's important to understand that we don't know why this can't make tryptophan. We don't know what enzyme got messed up. We have no idea. We just know it can't make tryptophan, okay? So we can actually detail these amino acid biosynthesis pathways a bit further and figure out what is the order of these biosynthetic pathways? Okay, what order do the enzymes participate? We can figure this out um, a little bit more in depth by just taking this mentality, this type of experiment a little further. Okay, so we're gonna use another example. Um, it would make sense to kind of continue down the tryptophan route, but your book switches uh, abruptly to methionine biosynthesis instead. Um, and just to keep in line with the book, that's gonna be the one that I will use, but a process would be similar, okay? So what's being shown here is the biosynthesis pathway for methionine. It's gonna be starting at the bottom. These are gonna be the reactions, okay? So each one of these um, items, these are gonna be the intermediate products. So if you start with homocerine, okay, a reaction, to O-acetylhomocerine, a reaction, um, cystothionine, reaction, homocysteine, reaction, methionine, okay? So these are gonna be actual items that are produced as we transition, we're kind of going down the pathway to make methionine, okay? We know that reactions are carried out by enzymes. So just above that, these are the enzymes that do this. Okay, so this is gonna be an enzyme that's gonna take our homocerine and produce O-acetylhomocerine. Okay, likewise, we have enzymes for each of these steps. Okay, and of course, you guys know enzymes, in principle, a lot of them are proteins, um, and these are gonna be proteins. So they are gonna be encoded for by a gene, all right? And here's gonna be the gene. Okay, and again, because it's 2021, we are really, you know, we're privy to some information that not everybody um, is privy to. Okay, but for right now, we have all the information. And remember, you know, like these names, we'll talk about them in a second. Okay, but just think about the idea that a gene encodes an enzyme, this enzyme does a job. Each one of these enzymes is going to do a job that gets us to methionine, which is something we need to live um, in the Rosper need as well. Another thing to note, just while we're on the slide, is that each of these um, loci or these genes, these um, net genes, was initially discovered as an oxytrophic mutant using the same process. So imagine, you know, you've like mutagenized just a lot of Neurospora, a uh, metric crap ton of Neurospora. They've got to grow them up and you find ones that can't grow without methionine, okay? But then you gotta figure out, you know, do they have differences? So this is a long process. And I think, again, realizing that each one of these had to go through the same process that we just detailed for tryptophan, I think that really also emphasizes the need for lots of offspring, okay? Because this is all just like a, you know, it's just a matter of chance. So having a lot of offspring is gonna give you a higher probability or maybe not necessarily higher probability. It's gonna make it more likely that you encounter something interesting. Okay, so this again is what we know. Now that this, you know, these experiments are gonna be complete. Okay, but let's think about it from the data that actual scientists had on the front end. Okay, so what they had was something kind of more like this, all right, so they actually, you know, they knew maybe not necessarily the complete order of this, all right, I kind of left it in order, but not necessarily the order, but biochemistry was a thriving science, and they knew that each one of these items was involved with making methionine at the end. They may not know the order. They certainly don't know what enzymes are doing it, and additionally, yeah, they, they don't have any access to information about the genes, okay? So 
It's a little bit like that, except if you want to go even further with this, okay, what they actually knew was not the locations on the gene. They knew, again, if we want to go back to that idea, a heritable unit. That is going to be uh, what they know. They don't know what chromosome it's on. They don't know what the sequence is. They don't know what it codes for. They know a heritable unit will result in a phenotypic difference. And so these, these are kind of the way people name loci. So Matt, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this is like a metabolism, um, but um, I'm just kind of throwing that out here off hand. But they know, they kind of label these by number. So like this was the second one I found. This was the third one I found. This was the fifth one I found. This was the eighth one I found. And they really, the only thing they know is that they're involved somehow with this. And in fact, these were in order when we looked at them. They actually don't know what order they're in either. They're just all over the place. Again, similarly with the reaction, they may know these intermediates are involved, but they don't necessarily know maybe what order they're in. And they certainly don't know what enzymes connect. So how do you even function to do genetics when you don't have any access to the genome, when you don't have DNA sequence, when you don't know what's going on? Okay, so that's the mindset. Like, how do we put this puzzle together? Okay, and again, it's all gonna tie back to observing the phenotype, okay? So what we're gonna look at on the next slide is actual table of data. Okay, so I wanna point out that across the top here, these should look a little bit familiar, okay? So these should look a little bit familiar. And these are gonna be like what they give to these neurospora on their minimal media. So minimal media plus O-acetylhomocerine, our minimal media plus cysteine, okay? Plus homocysteine plus methionine, okay? So that's what we're looking at across the top. Our mutant strains, are going to be again these are these are just their names like again what we know about these is that they can't make methionine that's about it okay and that we isolated them separately so each one of these can't make methionine and i'm not going to go into any depth with it now but there are ways to determine whether you know you're looking at the same gene or not you know whether these are going to be different genes but don't worry about that now the idea is these can't make methionine Okay, there are like four different ones. They can't make methionine. We don't know why. We don't know where in the pathway they go. But what we're going to do is we're going to grow each of these strains. Minimal media, minimal media plus L-acetylhomocerine, minimal media plus cysteine, minimal media plus homocysteine, minimal media plus methionine. Okay, so we're going to grow each of those and wild type as a control, adding each of these back. Okay, so that's the setup for the experiment. And what we're gonna look for is whether they are able to still grow, okay? And so that's gonna be indicated growth with a plus and no growth with a minus. So we're looking for the ability to grow. Our wild type of pore should be able to grow if we give it anything, okay? So our wild type, we don't give it anything. It can grow on minimal media. That was kind of the whole difference here is that these mutants can't grow in minimal media, whereas a wild type can't. So that's expected, okay? But here's some interesting things. So check it out. Our wild type, it's going to basically grow on anything you give it because it has a functional, fully functional pathway across the entire um, journey to methionine. You give it methionine at the end, excellent, okay? But notice each one of these is kind of different. Our MET5, if you give it minimal media, it's not gonna, it's not gonna grow. But if you start adding anything else back along this pathway, they're a lot. Okay. MET3, you're gonna see that again, if you give it cystathione, anything after that, it can grow. MET2, you have to give it either homocysteine or methionine. And MET8, man, you can't give this anything. It can't do anything unless you give it methionine. Okay, so what does that mean? This is again the data, this would be the kind of data that the scientists would look at. Okay, again, no genes, no like chart showing the way that it goes. They're figuring this out on their own, but let's tie it back to the visual a little bit better. 
okay? So let's think about it. And just for, um, again, our comfort at present, okay, we can kind of think about um, adding these guys in the blue squares back. And uh, mercifully, your book has put them in order that they actually will go in, in this pathway, okay? And so it's easy to compare. Again, our wild type's gonna grow across the board because if you give it O-acetylhomocerine, it has functional enzymes that can transition all the way through this pathway. Let's think about MET5, okay? So here's the deal. If you give it nothing, it can't grow. If you give it O-acetylhomocerine, it can. If you give it cystathionine, it can. If you give it homocysteine, it can. If you give it methionine, it can. Okay, so what that means is that you give it this, this enzyme works to make this. This enzyme then works to make this, and finally, this last enzyme works to make methionine. What's broken lies between nothing and O-acetylhomocerine. Okay, so this is the enzyme that's broken. Homocerine, transacetylase, okay, met pot. Again, they may not know what that enzyme is right now, but they know that this mutant is broken early in the pathway. Okay, and we know that because anything you give it after that mutation will keep it alive. Met three, okay, let's think about that. Minimal immediate, nope. Oacetylhomocerine, nope. But anything after that, we're golden. So think about it, okay? You give it homocerine. I mean, you give it, start with our minimal media. Our homocerine transacetylase will actually work, okay? And you can get, maybe you can get OSCO homocerine, but then you can't, this enzyme's broken. So you then can't make this. And if you can't make this, you can't make our next product. And if you can't make this, you can't make the thionine. So you're broken right here, okay? So again, look between the plus and minus. That's gonna be where the break is. Between these two products, that's gonna be this enzyme. Okay, MET2, similarly, you have to either give it homocysteine or methionine. That's where the break is, okay? So again, anything after the mutation will keep it alive. Anything before the mutation, it will die. Okay, and our last guy, MET8, it's broken in this last step. So even if you give it O-acetylhomocerine, it can make it all the way up to here, and then it can't make methionine. If you give it any of these other products, everything can proceed up until this point, but it can't make methionine. Okay, so the only solution is to just give it methionine. Okay, and so the point of this, again, is to learn to use these phenotypic observations to understand where things go in the biochemical pathway. And again, this might seem like an outdated technique because we do have access to, you know, genetic information, DNA, but the genome is a large place. And so even in modern genetics, we often have to do this type of experiment to sort of narrow down that we're gonna, you know, where to look more closely in the genome for this. We haven't necessarily gotten to that point in this experiment, but this does help us connect our sort of genotype to phenotype. And this is the way a lot of um, genetics experiments work to help us put pathways in order before we even knew what was going on, okay? And they may do this whole experiment, put this pathway in order and still never know this enzyme and gene information. They may, they may call this MET5 forever, okay? Um, obviously not because now we know the enzyme, but you know, when they collect this data, okay? So again, just some pointers. Any intermediate that you give after the mutated enzyme, the cells survive. If you had anything before the mutation, the cells can't survive. So you'll be able to practice this in your assignment. Okay, so just some conclusions. Our genes are gonna encode RNA, okay? That's gonna be some things that you can review in some of the previous um, 
sections of this assignment, okay? And then connecting genes to proteins and ultimately to phenotypes, which you know we can even use in more complex ways to understand biochemical pathways, sometimes even signaling pathways we can get some information about. And additionally, this can also help us understand the genetic basis of disease, ultimately. We've not talked about that a lot in this particular section, but we'll be talking about it a bit more as we proceed through this semester.